in honor of, of Ryan Sandberg, who passed away this week of prostate cancer. I, you're a Cubs fan, right? Are you a White Sox guy? How about Red Sox? Oh, you're a Red Sox. Okay, you're a Red Sox. But I switched as yeah. an adult. Well, okay. 18 years old. Well, I got three of my father, who was from Boston. There you go. So I, I mean, I grew up in Seattle. I'm a huge Mariners fan, but I idolized Ryan Sandberg. I played a little second base. Um, I mean, I was probably you know seven, eight, nine when he was just starting out and um, to find out first he had prostate cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, and then passed away of prostate cancer was was, um, was incredibly sad. And just simply a reminder that above all, this is this is why we're doing what we do is um, we want to stop this. So so when, when guidelines change, this is the past. And when the when guidelines change with the NCC and they put out the edits. And so th this was this was the edit. Version one, 2022, surveil preferred in pink. The edit is acts, acts the preferred strike through. Um, and of course, there are other modifications. And what I can tell you about the process is basically nothing <laughs> because um, I would be kicked off of the panel. It's um, it's totally confidential what goes on in those NCCN meetings. And, and even whether I spoke up or didn't speak up is is something that, that I, I can't speak to. Um, but yes, it, I thought this was wrong I, and it made no sense to me. And um, I was thrilled, beyond thrilled when this was reversed, when, when our panel was able to reverse it a couple months later. Um, it, you know, to me at the time, the problem was, and to some extent continues to be, over a treatment of low risk prostate cancer. The problem was not under treatment. And um, and so this was the wrong thing and it got corrected. This is the, here's the present. This is amongst many algorithms and may, some of you may have never looked at NCCN guidelines. One nice thing about those guidelines is they are very algorithmic. Now, of course, not every patient fits neatly into an algorithm but they, you know, there are, there's this basic structure for say, a, this is the low risk. Um, let's see if I've got a, I don't have a mouse, but you can see up in the left corner, this is for low risk patients, patients with low risk prostate cancer. Um, and at this point, the top kind of fork in the road says active surveillance preferred for most patients. Why just most patients? Well, I mean, Clearly, there are times when some patients with low risk prostate cancer may desire treatment, may need treatment. There are patients who can have, say, very high volume um, low risk prostate cancer, um, or you know. So, so NCCN is rarely going to say treatment is not an option. Although for very low risk prostate cancer, there is no, there's none of this, you know, decision tree. It's just active surveillance. But there's more nuance in the kind of the broader low risk population. And yet still it does say preferred for most patients. So that's where we are right now. Um, where are we going? Well, you know, what are the, what are the problems? Um, well, th this is, this is a, a huge study that I was very fortunate to be a part of. I am so fortunate to be a part of. It's the past prostate cancer active surveillance study run by Dan Lin, also known as the Canary Pass uh, study. Um, and this is an active surveillance registry that's been going on across 10 sites for about now over 15 years. Mi University of Michigan is a site. And this publication from last year was really the seminal publication so far from the past cohort. It was in JAMA. And I think it really captures what is going on right now in low risk prostate cancer. So if we look at 2000 plus participants, most with low risk prostate cancer, not all with low risk. And on the y-axis here is just the incidence, the percent over time, and time is on the x-axis at the bottom. And so the data here goes out to 12, 13 years from patients um, starting surveillance. And you can see that you know all cause mortality, which is you know deaths from heart attacks, other cancers, you name it, that's really going up over time, right? A lot of these. Uh, a lot of these patients are diagnosed with prostate cancer at, at older ages. And this is why we don't recommend treatment for everybody is because other causes, not prostate cancer, are much more common than prostate cancer death. 
Prostate cancer death is at the blue line at the bottom and virtually nobody died of prostate cancer. But the red line metastasis does go up a little bit over time. And this is everybody's greatest fear, right? So of 2000 plus patients in this cohort, um, I can't quite see the whole slide, but I, so I can't, I think the number's on there, but about 20 patients developed a metastasis over 12 years. That's not zero. It's about 1%. And so this is where we are. This is the reality. And this is, of course, every man's fear when they're diagnosed with low-risk prostate cancer and they're being recommended surveillance. And they say, well, 99% sounds pretty good, but it's not 100%. And we need to somehow get to 100%, obviously, with confidence. Oh, here it is. This is, the, yeah, so metastasis is 21 patients, prostate cancer deaths, three patients, and then a lot more other cause deaths. So I, I just put together four thoughts in the future of where we're going. Number one, there's no question in my mind that active surveillance rates will continue to increase over time and it will include the intermediate risk category. And so this is a paper led by Randy Vince, who's uh, currently at Case Western. Who, he was one of our urologic oncology fellows at the University of Michigan. The red line is the rate of active surveillance in music. Music started an initiative largely led by Jim Monty, David Miller, led this in initiative in 2014 and 15 to push active surveillance rates up. They were It was still low and variable across um, the, the entire state of Michigan. And sure enough, active surveillance rates rose in Michigan. Um, in low-risk patients, it's now upwards of 85, 90% of patients uh, managed initially by surveillance. This Again, this red line includes patients with intermediate risk disease. The blue line is kind of a national benchmark, a database called SEER. Um, and, you, and you could see that the, you know, the rates in SEER over time, initially the same as music, but have not increased. Now we've seen other data, you know, this only goes through 2019. We've seen other data that suggests that nationally uh, rates of surveillance are markedly increasing finally, 50%, 60% in, in lowest disease. And again, I have no doubt even though it looks like there's a plateau here um, in even in Michigan, again, more recent data that I've seen suggests that those rates are kind of like in an S pattern ticking up again. And so we, you know, we do feel confident that active surveillance is safe for the vast, vast, vast majority of patients with, uh, with low risk prostate cancer and even a subset of patients with intermediate risk prostate cancer. Number two is the future of digital pathology and artificial intelligence. And so of course, we know when a biopsy is done or when tissue is removed with a prostatectomy, it's put on a glass slide. That glass slide is stained and a pathologist looks at that glass slide, the tissue under the microscope. In the current era, those images are being digitized, uploaded. Actually, at Michigan, our pathologists, just as of September or October of last year, are no longer looking at the glass slides. For the most part, they're looking on a computer screen at the digitized images. What does that mean? If the image is digitized, it means that, uh, you know, it, it can be subjected to research, um, analyzing those images and using um, artificial intelligence um, capabilities. And so that the, the most classic is a, what's called a neural network that interprets that data with really without any knowledge of what it's looking at. It just fed in data and fed the outcome. And so this is an example of one, um, one platform, and there are several now, that uses both clinical data, so our usual stuff, age, PSA, grade, surgical margins, and T-stage, and the image data from pathology, and then it provides a risk prediction just based on that information. The, it turns out the image-based information adds a ton of predictive power to the model. And what do I think is going to happen? I think, ultimately, there are going to be a number of companies doing this. I think this is going to be largely commoditized. It's going to, you know, really anybody with access to this type of high quality data can develop these models. And I suspect that basically every tissue sample eventually will be run through these types of models. Pathologists will still be important and involved and engaged, but we're going to end up with really much more accurate um, risk prediction just based on the pathology alone. And that's going to be driven by these models. So this Artera AI, it's um, so multimodal AI is MMAI. Um, the Artera model 
when uh, tested on huge numbers of patients in a number of trials. So retrospective trials can be used because we can go back and scan in the images, say from a decade ago, and it works really well. Um, so red is the higher risk patients, orange is the intermediate risk patients, just based on the risk grouping model, and then low risk in blue. Distant metastasis is on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And, and really just, you know, all it takes is this image-based information coupled with our usual predictive tools prog or prognostic tools, and we can get this really clear stratification of risk that works really well. What do we? What is the AI platform looking at? Like, what is it in those images that's important? We don't know. Um, one could argue that it doesn't really matter that much what it's looking at as much as the fact that it's de developing um, or, or it's, it, it, it is accurate in its prognostic ability. So number three is the adoption of biparametric, biparametric or non-contrast MRI. I just want to highlight that Howard, per usual, was all over this in the active surveiller. Um, and so this is something that has, I think, become really prominent just in the last three to six months that it's really started ticking up on people's radars who are paying attention. And I think actually it's um, something that a lot of folks in the urologic oncology community aren't yet aware of, but they will be soon, that contrast may not be necessary. And I would say probably isn't necessary for the majority of prostate MRIs that we conduct. Why, why should we not use contrast? Well, it means more time in the scanner. It's more costly. It means getting stuck with an IV. Um, some people can have reactions to that contrast. And we can, of course, do more scans per whatever time interval if we are if if the scan time is shorter. So it's it's more efficient. Would we use contrast if it's really helpful? Of course. But it turns out that contrast really isn't that helpful. So the AUA guidelines highlight the use of multi-parametric magnetic res resonance imaging. What's multi-parametric MRI as opposed to biparametric MRI? It's really a very specific phase of the MRI called dy dynamic contrast enhanced phase. It's really just the use of contrast to help look at the MRI to find tumors. It is still in the guidelines to use multi-parametric MRI. Well, we've looked at this and Ben Pakros has really led this effort at University of Michigan, one of our star residents. He's highlighted differences in costs based on use of contrast. And so of course, using contrast turns out to be far more expensive, about $500 when we look at um, commercial price differences. But then the question is, well, is it really as good? Um, and the answer is yes. So there's a there's a big trial that was presented about a year ago called the PRIME trial, where patients underwent um, a biparametric and a multiparametric MRI. And they in, in their biopsies were um, and kind of all the, the interpretation of the biopsies was based on whether something was targeted uh, um, that was seen on the biparametric phase or something that was targeted based on the multiparametric phase. And so, we, so they're able to look at differences um, in really what did the multiparametric MRI, the contrast phase add to the diagnosis of prostate cancer. And the punchline is that it added virtually nothing. That overall the clinically significant cancer detection rates, meaning in this study, Gleason three plus four or above, um, were no different, 29% in the multiparametric MRI group, 28.8% in the biparametric MRI group. There were really only two patients, I, I think, or around two or three patients where there was a significant difference, um, something that would have been missed on the biparametric MRI out of, out of a huge, you know, 500 patient study. So this is, I, I have no doubt, we've actually um, converted for the vast majority of our patients who are undergoing surveillance MRIs, we've, we've converted at the University of Michigan to biparametric MRI just in the last year or so. Our analysis of our initial data is, is in line with this, that it looks like it, it's really just as good. Last comment is my kind of the, the one that I'm most excited about. The, the most common question that I get from patients is, okay, that's, that's you know, I, I hear you and we'll do your plan, but what can I do as a patient? Tell me like what, 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 you know, I'm game. And we don't have great answers to that. And I think I'm sure all, all of us give different answers. And I'll tell you, about, you know, the things that I say, well, it's pretty, I say pretty generic stuff. I say avoid processed food, say you should exercise. Um, I said, you know, try to get some, you know, good, good sleep. Eight hours is great, you know, kind of a good target and try to minimize stress, which is 
a lot of hand wavy stuff. Well, here's, I think the, um, oh, first, some people say, well, it's best you don't know what to do because you guys haven't looked at it. Like nobody cares about this. There's no, no pharma companies paying for this. Actually, there have been really high quality studies looking at diet and um, like different stress-based interventions in prostate cancer active surveillance. This is a big JAMA, you know, trial in JAMA led by Kelly Parsons called the MEAL study where patients were randomized to a, um, a dietary intervention with increased vegetable consumption. And the question was, well, did that impact um, progression for guys on surveillance? And the answer was no. So that was a huge disappointment. It was a negative study. Well, the most exciting study of, of the year so far, in my opinion, comes from colon cancer. And it's this, this was a structured exercise study for patients who underwent surgery for colon cancer, followed by chemotherapy. So big caveat, this is not a prostate cancer study. We don't know if this will translate to prostate cancer. Um, but what they did is they took patients and they were randomized to a control group where they got kind of what I do, which is, hey, you should exercise. Um, here's some information about good overall health. And then an, an exercise group where patients got an intervention of three years of support from a physical activity consultant, kind of basically a trainer. And it turns out that the exercise group had a far superior disease-free survival. So this is yellow um, in each of these curves. So higher is better. That means fewer patients are having recurrences. And then in the bottom figure, overall survival. So this is like the ultimate metric in cancer studies. So these patients in the exercise group were not only having fewer recurrences of their cancer, but they were living longer at, you know, at, at a much, this is, these are big differences. We look, these are curves called Kappa-Meyer curves. And when we see differences like this, we're thinking this is, we think of some home run drug, but here it was exercise and the exercise, it turns out the most common um, regimen that patients were doing was four 45 minute brisk walks a week, like real, like brisk, like getting a little bit short of breath, but not, that, not really fancy. And so I'll tell you, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's my recommendation for my patients when, when we have this conversation at, at this point has been going forward. It's something that's more specific. Um, and it, I think it's more tangible. Will it work in prostate cancer? We don't know. Um, but boy, I, I think there's no harm in trying. So with that, again, thank you to Aspie. Thanks, Dr. Monty, for the great introduction. This, again, this means a lot. This is our urologic oncology team at University of Michigan. We, we do have an amazing team me getting to be here is partly because Dr. Monty called me out of the blue when I was a fellow and said, hey, we got a great team at the University of Michigan. We come take a look. I'll tell you what, we've got an amazing, amazing team, um, phenomenal colleagues. And and they, uh, they, they mean, frankly, the world to me. Thank you.